Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our talk uh, from the Dropbox Trenches. Before we get started, we want to tell you a little bit about ourselves. So my name is Tony Gru. I'm a developer at Dropbox. Um, most recently, I worked on a mobile photos app that we built and released earlier this year called Carousel. Um, before that, I worked on the Dropbox mobile app that's on Android. And before that, I was at Microsoft working on Windows Phone for a number of years um, on the email, SMS, and search clients. Um, a lot of that's been in C++, but some of that's been in Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, um, and so forth. And uh, my name is Steven Cabis. I haven't quite been as long at Dropbox as long as Tony has, uh, but I've been working on the last uh, like iteration of Mailbox, which is um, a product that joined Dropbox in the last year and a half. I've been working on kind of a cross-platform uh, building solutions for that. And previous to that, I was working at Mailbox on kind of our core IMAP sync with Gmail, Yahoo, iCloud, et cetera. Um, so that's just a bit about us. Uh, we actually wanted to poll the audience a little bit. I know there's not a ton of application developers at this conference, but uh, how many of you guys like have worked on Android or work on Android? Cool. iOS? Awesome. Um, anybody else mobile? Oh, cool. I'm just maybe Firefox OS or something. Web OS? <laughs> um, and what about desktop or web? Oh, awesome. And then um, just library developers? All right, we've got a good mix of stuff here. Um, that's fine. We're going to be mostly focused on mobile today, but we'll touch a little bit on um, some desktop stuff as well. Um, before we get started, um, we're going to have probably a few sections throughout the talk that are going to be good for questions. So if you have questions, if you don't mind holding off, and then at like the various points in the talk, we will like prompt if you guys have any questions. Uh, it just works better for us. Um, and this stuff is, can get deep and we can get on tangents. We just want to stay away from that. Um, and one more thing. So Dropbox is fairly new to the C++ community. Um, we're here. We're trying to like meet some people. We're trying to like share our ideas and get ideas from other people. So if you guys see anyone with a Dropbox shirt on, there's three sitting in the front. And Tony and I uh, are the ones at the conference. So we're mostly wearing Dropbox gear, and if you come talk to us and you say something, maybe even one thing interesting, uh, you can get a five gig space card from us, and uh, hopefully more than that, we can share ideas uh, and stuff about C++ in the mobile space and cross-platform in general. Um, so with that, let's get started. All right, so to understand why we're giving this talk today, I think it's useful to spend a little time on Dropbox's history uh, in mobile development. So around 2012, um, we had a mobile app for iOS and a mobile app for Android. The iOS one was in Objective-C, the Android one was in Java using the Android framework. And that was okay, but later that year, we started working on this feature, Camera Uploads, where we you know, scan your phone for pictures, hash them, see if they're not on your Dropbox account yet, upload them. Um, and while it sounds pretty easy, and in fact, we mistakenly thought it was a pretty easy feature to build when we started, uh, we learned really quickly it's a city of edge cases. Um, and we had a very small team. At that time, we had about three, at one point, four people working on mobile total in the company. And we were building on two platforms, Android and iOS. Um, and we needed to build them at the same time, but even though it was about a six-month project, they ended up shipping four months apart. And another problem that we experienced was you would fix a bug on Android or iOS, and months later, um, the other team would hear about that bug and be like, oh, yeah, we already fixed that like you know, months ago. Um, so we grew really envious of the desktop development situation at Dropbox, uh, where we do desktop development primarily in Python with a bit of C++ and then different UI shims for the different platforms. Um, so we started investigating possible solutions. What could we do? Could we use HTML5? Uh, we had seen Facebook attempt this and had talked with them a lot about it. And we were also wary of a platform that we couldn't really dig into the performance of rendering because we care about user experiences a lot. Um, also, talking to the platform is a little tricky. There are solutions like PhoneGap, but most of them in, like, incurred either overhead or latency of where the platform actually was. Uh, we looked at things like Qt Quick, which was really developing at the time, much better now. Uh, Kivi, which is still really quite a developing framework where you could be uh, fully in C++ or fully in Python and cross-platform framework. Um, and we also looked at Xamarin, and Xamarin is actually probably the most promising one we didn't go with. And it's changed a lot even since we evaluated it that makes it more promising. Finally, we looked at um, rolling our own UI framework. Uh, but we made the list of requirements that we needed to build um, the apps that we wanted to build. So Dropbox and 
uh, and also apps that we knew were potentially on the horizon. And this is a long list, but some of the most important ones here are being able to plug in the rendering framework at any point, um, having edit controls that are native. So edit controls, if, if you've ever worked on one, are some of the most complicated controls uh, in any user interface. And you really want them to feel right. Anytime cut and paste doesn't work correctly, even on a mobile, especially on a mobile platform where typing is a pain, uh, it can be a big problem. And then a really big one is integrating with the OS's control flow well. So on Android, you have an acti activity and an intent model. On iOS, you've got the app delegate. We really wanted to make sure that uh, we're true to the platform and our app doesn't feel out of place. It doesn't feel just like, you know, like a game can sometimes feel on a mobile app platform where you're switching in and out. So based on this, nothing really met our requirements except for building it all ourselves. And again, we were like a three or four person team and we're really more concerned with delivering features. Um, and then came the mission to build the Photos app. And when we came to build the Photos app, uh, one thing we wanted to do is not just build a web app on mobile. We wanted to build an app that is in the spirit of Dropbox. So we wanted to build an app that works completely offline. You can delete photos offline, you can take photos offline, you can view photos offline. You can even like create shares and they'll sit pending and those shares will sync uh, when you become online. And so we knew that this was gonna require a lot of offline business logic and we really, really did not want to write this twice. Um, around the same time that we were considering building this photos app, something else happened. So at the same time, um... Mailbox and Dropbox kind of teamed up. I had had the pleasure of working at a very small startup for a long time, and uh, Dropbox was nice enough to bring us into their family. And we had a, um, a similar but slightly different problem. Uh, we had an iOS-only app. I would say like our entire code base was legacy, just for the fact that it's an, an Objective-C. And um, we wanted to port to Android. Uh, so we had two choices in front of us. We could either rewrite the whole thing in Java, or we could rewrite the whole thing in C++. Um, and it's, pretty obvious that we wanted to do it in C++, uh, even if like um, we didn't have any other platforms in mind. C++ is just way more awesome. Um, but we also had like a pretty small team. We didn't want to re-implement everything as soon as we went to a desktop platform. Um, so we had all the same problems that uh, Dropbox had already been thinking about for some time, um, just in slightly different, um, like different lens on the problem. So, Obviously, I set up the fact that we're going to have that we're going to be using C++. But as an app team, we weren't ready to make that switch. Uh, you might not be surprised; there are very few developers in the community that build iOS or Android apps that use C++, except for like the rarest cases. Maybe they'll call down to the JNI for like one or two things. Um, but uh, and we were reluctant to like take such a big risk when we're going to be taking a big risk building a new product at the same time. We didn't want to. New platform, new product, it gets pretty scary. Um, around that time, though, also, we are building some new APIs. And API in particular, we call the Sync API and also data stores, where we're building APIs that take the, so for application developers, we provided REST APIs. But there's a lot of complicated business logic to actually build an app that uses our APIs correctly in an offline manner in poor network connectivity conditions. Um, so we wanted to build that for our app developers. And in fact, you can see this diagram here. This is, uh, I think Guido Van Razum put together this uh, diagram. This is the state changes that occur in data stores. Um, so really quickly, we realized, hey, like we need a cross-platform solution for this. Uh, so we basically built it in C and wrapped it in a bunch of different languages, Python, Android, Objective, well, Python, Java, Objective-C, and there's also you know, future languages we might be wrapping this in. Uh, in fact, we were even talking about today, maybe like compiling this into JavaScript, uh, you know, but we'll see about that. Um, so we have this sync implementation. Um, and one thing is we actually built this in C and got our feet wet before jumping into C++. We started with C because every language can interface with C, um, but we later regretted that mistake. And so when we came to build, um, the Carousel app and the Mailbox app, when we came to rebuild Mailbox for Android and V2 on iOS, um, we decided, hey, we're actually not just going to learn from the Sync API, we're gonna leverage the Sync API internally. And this allowed us to get started. So we had a networking abstraction uh, in C++ where we wrapped uh, the networking libraries. We had database and storage abstractions built for us. We had a user model built for us. 
We already had some of the API implemented in there. And we had even started playing with photos. So we knew that this is not going to be a super risky decision. Still a lot of things we didn't know. Still a lot of the teams didn't know C++. Uh, but we decided to give it a go. And so that's a little bit of the background. And before jumping into the architecture and some of the things that we learned, I want to show you a couple quick demos here of our apps to see what we were able to do with C++ and the native UIs. Um, so this is the Photos app. And you might be, if you've used the Cloud Photos app before, uh, there's usually a lot of gray squares. It's usually not super responsive. On Android, you often have a lot of glitching while well, the garbage collector is kicking in. Uh, but C++ really allowed us to build a beautiful cross-platform abstraction uh, to do some good stuff. And here is Mailbox. Just in case you haven't used it, you can get a sense. Cool. All right, so the first question we had to answer when building these apps is, what is the architecture going to be? Um, how many of you are familiar with MVVM? All right, sweet. Almost everyone is familiar with it. That's awesome. Um, I'm really glad MVVM has gained so much adoption in the last couple of years. Um, you guys know MVC, you guys know MVM, MVVM, and the nice thing about it, of course, is that there's some really clean layers, and so we were pretty confident that, hey, we can build our entire model layer, uh, the vast majority of our business logic in C++, and then what we're going to do is we're going to build the view model and the view in Objective-C or Java on each platform. Um, and this architecture felt pretty clean. When we actually got to implementing it, it looked like this. Um, you have two platform-specific UIs, two platform-specific view models, a Java wrapper or an Objective-C wrapper to what's going on in C++, JNI on Android, your C++ header file, and then actually your C++ header implementation. Um, there's a lot going on there. And this was pretty interesting. So we actually slogged through this for a little while. Um, you know, if you wanted to implement one function, there were about five files that you had to change. Uh, and we had evaluated some tools, um, but none of them really jumped out at us. Um, and besides implementing it the first time, the biggest problem with this is, so you got all this reg code here that you don't really want to be writing. Um, if you have a signature, a variable name, a function name, it's in uh, both of the green layers right above and below the red, and then in all the red code. So just changing a function name was incredibly painful. And it was pretty hilarious uh, what people would do to avoid changing signatures. Um, also, you would have functions or parameters that were named differently at many layers. And so if you had a bug on the Java side and you go on to the C++ side, it's like a new language that you're talking. Um, so really quickly, we were like, hey, we got to do something about that. Um, we got to like collapse all that into like a simple language bridge um, and make that go away. Uh, that way, application developers can kind of just see this language bridge, basically just a service that is always online. Uh, it's local. It's fast. It's like you're talking to a server um, as a UI developer. Um, and as a business logic developer, you can just consider yourself implementing a service. And now the only thing the two sides have to agree on is what this language bridge looks like. Uh, so we learned, A, you got to have really, really strong encapsulation here. There are times where you want to leak through, but it's almost never in your long-term interest. Um, number two, everything should look the same on both layers. So uh, for a while, we had like enums in C++, but int constants in Java. And that's just not very good. Uh, and then the final lesson here is like to make this all possible, you basically have to use a tool for this layer. Uh, it's just not possible otherwise. And there are a number of options. Uh, who's familiar with SWIG? All right, so a bunch of you guys are familiar with SWIG. And there are a handful of other JNI options. Um, we didn't particularly love any of them, so we rolled our own. Uh, and Alex and Andrew are giving a talk on Thursday, and they'll talk more about why we rolled our own and the features of that layer. Um, another lesson we learned, so we go back to this guy right here, is that um, view models actually have a lot of code. So for photos, uh, you might have our photo model might be a list of photos, also potentially a list of events. Uh, 
we actually use vectors, of course. Um, and then you have a view model, which might be like a vector of rows. And rows are either like a header on a photo section or a row of photos. And whether it's a header or a photo, it belongs in an event. And the vector of photos is optional. Um, and then this is like one model and view model pair, maybe for like our main grid view, but we have a very similar view model for our hidden photos and a very similar view model for conversations. Um, and view models for us actually turned out to be pretty complicated to implement in some cases because we wanted everything to work um, without having ever been blocked on I.O. So if you hide a photo, you delete a photo, that actually is reflected in the view model right away. Uh, and then we propagate that down to the model, and then the model responds um, telling us that that has been committed, and then we remove it out of the view model because the photo's already gone in the model, and then the server worries about syncing it. Um, and so it actually turns out that the view models on both platforms end up looking very nearly similar, uh, except for like maybe the outermost edge is like adapted to your iOS list view, or is adapted to the Android adapter in list view. Um, and so we were like, hey, we got to figure out how to write platform agnostic view models. And we gave this a shot. And uh, so now, basically, only our UIs, only our views are platform specific in Java and Objective-C. Everything else, our view model, our business logic, are in C++. There are also cases where we call back in uh, to the platform specific layers from C++. Um, and the lesson learned there is actually sharing view models makes sense. It saves us a lot of time. Uh, we're a much bigger team than we were in 2012, but uh, we're still a very small team. Uh, and there aren't very many people who work on each app. So doing things twice is, is really hard on us. Um, also, you get a lot better cross-platform consistency and better code quality by doing this. So when you have two developers each approaching a problem from a different point of view, the interface that gets built for these view models ends up being a lot better, a lot more elegant. Um, and when you're implementing view models, you really want to optimize performance. So the translation from your model to your view model, you want to take almost no time. Uh, and so it's really nice to be able to optimize performance once. It's also nice to be able to do it in C++. Uh, and final lesson we learned uh, is actually C++ 11 and 14 are very approachable to application developers. So we had very few people with experience in C++ when we decided to take this journey. Uh, most people knew uh, Java really well or Objective-C really well just because they were iPhone developers. And you know we were concerned. What's going to happen? Are they going to understand our AI? Are they going to understand how exceptions work on the platform? Are they going to understand managing your own memory? Um, are the containers that are going to be there, are the containers going to be there if they expect them to be? Um, are the threading primitives going to be there? And it's not a standard, but we pulled in optional also to deal with null versus non-nullable things. Um, and what we found out is actually surprisingly, well, you might cringe. If you're a Java developer or an iOS developer, you can kind of write C++ like you're used to. And then through the process of code reviews, you'll become more idiomatic in C++. Uh, and this actually works pretty well. Uh, we built apps. They work. Um, the C++ code uh, has become increasingly better. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about the architecture? On the, like, are we planning to use C++ on desktop? Is that the question? Yeah, so uh, we will talk more about that later on the slide. Um, in short, we're probably not going to go back to our desktop client and rewrite it, partially because our mobile clients have different design goals than our desktop clients. Um, although this experience has enabled our desktop team to reach into C++ more, um, because now we have patterns and practices and standards and tools across the company. Um, yeah, but uh, there are some desktop clients that will start using these frameworks, and we'll talk more about this. Any other questions? I had an arrow for going, uh, going from the bottom of the stack to things for like network, much more specific. What are the three go-tos for the network? 
Yeah, so I don't want to scoop Andrew and Alex, uh, but they'll be talking about that on Thursday at their talk. But um, I mean, there's two choices. You can either roll your own uh, and you know build your own network libraries, either like bring in OpenSSL and you know an HTTP layer, or you can use the like uh, the platforms. Uh, and those are they'll talk about some of the decisions and the trade-offs that we saw there. Other questions? Cool. Um, can you guys hear me? OK, cool. Uh, so we're just going to actually dive into a couple examples. We'll do one specific to Mailbox, and we will do uh, one as well that's uh, specific to um, Carousel. Um, so we're just going like, to take a look at architecture and just dive in. Um, so for Mailbox, like I said, we had a slightly different goal than Carousel did uh, initially. Um, we had an entirely Objective-C app, and we needed to uh, port it to Android. That was our core goal. So as like an application developer, just keeping in mind your end goal and that you don't go down the crazy road of like cross-platform development and making it work everywhere, FreeBSD, Windows, uh, Mac, we just wanted to like actually service our users. Um, so we kind of laid out at a high level what it took to get there. And it was three things. Um, the first one was port all of our legacy Objective-C code into shiny new C++. Uh, and that's actually a pretty straightforward process. I'm sure you guys can imagine how that goes. Um, if you want hints, you can kind of search replace your uh, angle brackets and you get about halfway there. Um, we also needed to relaunch iOS with like no regressions. This is like a little counterintuitive that we need to fix iOS and able to build Android. Um, if you think about it a little bit, it makes a ton of sense. Um, and for any of you guys who have like launched software out to users with even a small bug or regression, like an angry mob of users is one of the scariest things you can go up against. They, they don't care like how clean your abstractions are. They don't care like that you hot swapped out 50,000 lines of Objective C for C++. They just want their app to work the same as it did yesterday. They want it to be as fast and as performant. Um, so that was actually one of the major goals, and I'll focus on that uh, for the for the remainder of this. But the last thing is like obvious as well. We needed to build Android on top of a shared C++ library um, that we can leverage. And again, um, as Tony mentioned, um, Andrew and Alex on Thursday will be going deeper into this uh, particular part of it. Um, not only Android, but cross-platform mobile in general. So like I said, let's uh, jump into number two. Um, the biggest thing that we hit um, as a stumbling block whenever we were going on this uh, sort of journey is to replace core data. Do you guys know what core, core data is, everybody? OK, so actually, not a lot. Um, core data is kind of like uh, SQLite on iOS. It's the thing that like Apple tells you to use, the de facto standard. Um, it does mostly object persistence. It's kind of a fancy ORM. Um, that's actually a pain to work with. Um, but, so our first step was to remove that. And um, so what it did for us was data persistence. And if we were evaluating SQLite, SQLite does data persistence. That's great. Um, we were doing data relationships. So I've like heard of a foreign key before, mostly. Um, so I think I could probably wire that up for relationships as well. The last thing it provides is this um, NS blah, 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 blah notification. Um, it's, if you're on iOS, you know exactly what this is uh, talking about, but what it does is give you nice animations between different um, instances in a list view. So it gives you nice collapse animations and expand animations if you have added or removed data from the underlying data source of the list view. Um, so this obviously isn't built into SQLite. SQLite knows nothing about core data or Cocoa. Um, so we had to basically re-implement this and figure out how we were going to launch iOS and provide the same interaction as it did before for all of our users um, in the wild. Um, we're C++ developers, so I thought I'd just go over some concepts in straight code. Uh, so we have three concepts. The first one is a data view. Um, this is kind of what you might think of a view model. Um, our, view and, our view model and model are a little bit closer than it is in Carousel. But you just get a count, and then you actually can pull out data individually um, from the view. Uh, this is, excuse me, this is what powers um, an iOS Cell for row at index path, uh, and on Android it powers like a git view in like a base adapter or list adapter. Uh, then we have a data query, and take a look at this real quick. Uh, you could throw this into a standard function if you wanted to. Um, and any of you uh, design patterns guys will notice this is just an abstract data view factory. Um, so Java developers right at home. Um, and this is just basically producing data views as time changes. Some examples for this for Mailbox are a list of unread emails, uh, emails in a particular thread, a conversation thread, and also like contacts matching a search string. Um, something really important to note here is that these actually change over time. So if we are showing emails um, on the like, main screen and a new email comes in, 
that data query will produce a new data view uh, for us to basically show the new data. And the last one is uh, the change set, which is what I kind of call it like a UI diff. Um, and we provide this like UI diff up to UI table view and also uh, list view on Android to, to, let it, um, to enable it to do smooth animations between the, the previous data view and then the next data view. Um, this is what that kind of, whoops, excuse me. This is what that looks like. It's pretty simple. You have a vector of indexes of the things that have been deleted. You have a vector of indexes of things that have been inserted. Um, and then a vector of indexes of things that have been updated. That way, if your, your views don't change order, but they actually change the underlying data, uh, iOS knows to like, redraw these views. Um, and you'll notice there's no move on here. You can actually move data inside of a view, um, but it turns out you can um, represent a move with a delete and an insert. Uh, so the move was something that was kind of interesting for Mailbox, because we wanted to animate differently on move than we did on delete and did on insert. So we just like, kind of augmented it with this, these various different move types. So we have, instead of just insert and delete, we have move inserts and move deletes. We still put them inside the same structure like this because this is kind of what, exactly what UI Table View expects. And since Android doesn't provide any of these facilities, uh, we figured that Apple had thought about the problem a little bit more than we had. So we went ahead and went with that. So those are the core concepts. Um, that's everything we need to build like nice animations. Uh, and now let's go through how they relate. So at like time one, we have a data query. Let's say it's all of your emails. Um, and it produces a data view. This is just all the emails in your inbox at our like, main mailbox view that you guys saw earlier. And then time, time passes, you get a new email, your like, boss replies to you. And so this produces a new data view. So now you have data view one and data view two. Uh, you could immediately just swap those things out and you'll get no animation, you'll get a jerk like you normally do on Android and you'll just have new data immediately appear. But that's not what we wanted. So we introduced this little four step in here that we're gonna do some kind of magical diff on these two data views um, to construct the change set. And I'll go into this later, but just for now, assume that it's fast enough and that it's magic. <laughs> Trust me, we'll go back. Um, and this last thing is nothing that we had to implement, uh, but if you look at it closely, you can tell this is what UI table view, um, or like an Android uh, list view is doing in the background. It's taking its previous data view and taking the new change set and animating all the changes to the new, to the new, um, to the new view. So we get those nice collapses and animations that we were looking for. Uh, so I'll go back to this like little magic thing here. Um, so you can have data sizes anywhere from like one, two, to like thousands, to like tens of thousands. And kind of depending on which uh, class of those, three, of those three buckets you fall into, you'll do different things. Um, so for example, if you guys sold Chandler's talk and you only have 10 items, you probably just want to bubble sort this in a vector. You do the naive algorithm, n squared, just pound through it, it'll be fast enough. Um, if, you, if you have your data that fits in memory, I think you can probably just like throw a bunch of hash tables at it and it'll be fast enough. Um, but th this is specific to our application, but uh, in all seriousness, um, if you add like some sort uh, predicates and you add like equality predicates on these things, you can kind of do like the merge step and a merge sort and just like bounce through them. Use very little memory and just kind of iterate down your data views to, to do this change set. And for us, um, this is fast enough for our data sizes and for our batch sizes. I'd say for your particular applications, um, profile it, see, see what's fast enough for you guys. Um, but you're all smart enough in the room here to actually generate uh, what this like, diff function will look like. So I'm gonna go back to this first, uh, these first three steps. They're all related, and they're actually very application specific. For Mailbox, um, producing a new data view from a data query is simply running a SQLite query. And like I said, it is fast enough for us. It runs in a background thread. We are doing like latency comp compensation so that the user actually doesn't perceive um, this latency. Um, doing this on a background thread with on the order of 100 items is extremely fast on SQLite. And then actually, since we're going to SQLite, your diff algorithm doesn't matter how fast it is. Um, that, disk is that disk access is going to dominate. Um, and then the last thing that I didn't really go over is this number five. Um, and this is like something that's very specific to iOS, something that we needed to implement on Android. Uh, but I was like writing my slides there and I kind of had an interesting observation that this sort of model is similar to database replication. So if you picture your service layer as um, being a, the master database set, you picture your UI as being a replica of this data, this change set one, two here, this change set is like simply the diff that you would apply in like a backend database system to get the replica up to sync with the master. So this would be like write ahead logging, um, 
on some things. Uh, journaling is a like, similar concept. Uh, so it's kind of those like well-studied things that are brought into like a UI context. Um, so this is like a kind of cool architecture, I guess. I'm a little biased because I helped write it. Um, but did it actually work? And that's an important to go back and see uh, if the, the choices you made earlier, did they work or not? And I have a quick little, um, well, demo. I recorded it. And what you guys are going to see here is this is actually uh, two devices for the same user running Mailbox. A little preview of the Mailbox desktop in the background here. Uh, but this is running on real servers. This isn't running on localhost or anything. And I'm just going to show you guys um, what goes on here. So as soon as you're swiping, um, the same thing happens on both of these platforms. And regardless of whether you're swiping, swiping local or like getting a remote notification, you see they're going both ways. Uh, the update model doesn't matter. So we actually significantly simplified our code this way. Um, whenever a user swipes on the iPhone, the UI doesn't actually animate away. It just waits to be told to animate. So that way, um, an action that's coming from like, the user and an action that's coming from like, another user on the server is going to end up being the same exact animation, same code. Less code leads to less bugs. Um, so that was uh, basically like what we got on iOS. Um, wins on iOS in this architecture. I'm going to bring Tony back up here because he's the Android expert. Let's talk about what we got uh, out of Android with this architecture. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, any questions about this? Uh, yeah. Um, you got a new beta desktop app. Yep. Uh, Absolutely. All, all of our apps are running this new C++ framework now. Uh, code to desktop instead of code to touch. Does that make a difference? Um, so I'm not familiar with the desktop platforms, but we run, like, our, all of our data is, like, written in C++, and we do use the, the UI frameworks of the platform. Well, code to touch and code to desktop are pretty similar. They're, yes, they're similar. Um, there's, we've run into, like, quite a few different um, differences between them. Um, yeah, you just like submit one of those queries. You say, I'm going to look at all the unread emails. Then you get this little list back. As you scroll, you can like page in data behind. Um, same thing as the iPhone. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. I'll pass back off to Tony to talk about Android. All right, so Stephen gave you some insight into uh, what it took to move an aspect to iOS uh, on top of C++. And now I want to talk to you about some uh, just outright wins we had on Android. And these wins are really nice because if you're trying to sell your team on using C++, you can like, give them these stories, and uh, they'll make believers. Um, so at a high level, there's a couple wins here. Better awareness of what's going on. You get the circumvent the garbage collector on Android and uh, you get to hide some memory from Android. So we'll dive into each of these. Um, so the first one I would say is, by going down into C++ as an application developer, you obviously gain insight into how the platform's working. So a lot of Android under the covers is C++. They use SQLite, standard SQLite, everyone else does, maybe with some patches. Um, but then they wrap it in the Java in another abstraction for Android users, a SQLite cursor. And SQLite Cursor has a lot of interesting platform-specific behavior that uh, we'll talk about how you can discover this behavior because, you know, Android's open source. But in particular, um, if a query you do is greater than two megabytes, for example, um, the cursor pages that query for you. Um, but what's really interesting is it pages it both by row position, uh, which is almost never correct, um, and it does it on the UI thread. So the first time you read any data, if you do it on a background thread, you're good to go. But when you cross that two megabyte boundary, um, it will happen on the UI thread. And you can actually see this. So you know, we're like, why are we having this horrible performance? Um, if you have like 30,000 photos, uh, we're a little aggressive about paging your metadata into memory. So we can easily have four, six, 10, 15 megs of photo metadata. Um, and you see on this onMove function, where you're moving the iterator one forward, um, there's a fill window function. And you look at the implementation of fill window, and it takes the current position and where you're trying to move for, and will re-execute the query based on that. 
a um, little hard to read here, but m.query fill window. Um, and so by switching to C++, we had to actually learn how SQLite works, which as application developers, we didn't necessarily know. We knew how Android SQLite works. And this actually took a lot of the mystery of performance on the platform away from us. Uh, so now for small and medium queries, we just read everything in the memory at once. For really large queries, we're paging under the covers, though, in the model and the view model. So the actual UI developer actually doesn't have to worry about paging. They just tell us what offset they're at and uh, where they want to move that in their view. And then we'll just make sure that the data is available for them or asynchronously provide it. And we do all our paging based on a sort key. Um, so you know, we solve one big problem right there, which is like you're scrolling, and all of a sudden, your UI just locks up uh, just by switching to C++. There are workarounds. You can work around this in Java by like managing multiple cursors and doing the paging yourself. But now you're like fighting a layer of the framework when you really could just be writing against the framework directly, around, against SQLite directly. Another win is uh, defeating the garbage collector. And as C++ developers know, garbage collectors are like something everyone loves to hate on. Um, and I'm no garbage collector hater, to be perfectly honest. Like on the desktop, JVM, as we all know, the garbage collector is pretty good. On Dalvik, the garbage collector is less good. Um, and Google is actually pretty aware of this. Uh, I'll show you how aware. Uh, and it's improving in Android L, but you'll still have this problem. So when we started building Carousel, Nexus 4 was like the latest device at the time. Um, and if you have a 10,000 object app, which is basically if you just create an app in the Android App Studio, uh, it will have about 10,000 objects because of all the resources and strings that the framework loads up. Uh, you have you know, two to five millisecond garbage collection time or so. If you have 50,000 objects, which is about like what our core Dropbox app has, the basic Dropbox app that we've had for years, uh, your garbage collection can like sneak up into 10 to 30 milliseconds. Um, and if you have 500,000 objects of memory, which is what we were trying to do in Carousel because we were like super aggressive about pre-caching metadata and some other stuff, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, we had about 500,000 objects on large accounts, uh, half a second garbage collection. And usually garbage collection tries to happen concurrently in Android. So it happens on, you know, one of the other cores usually, and then only stops the world at the beginning and end of garbage collection cycle. Uh, but that doesn't always happen. So we really needed to address this because a 500 millisecond pause is not OK. Um, so basically, we just moved all our photo metadata in the C++, uh, which you know, is the architecture I've shown you already. Um, and instantly, 300,000 objects disappear from the garbage collections view. Um, and you could say, hey, Tony, like, why are you caching 300,000 objects? Um, because it makes performance better. Uh, <laughs> but not if you do it in Java. Uh, so that was like a really nice win. And we just provide this like, simple, like, hey, what's the size of this list? And get me like, information about this list. And it's a little more complicated because you express where your viewport is also. Um, defeating the garbage collector story number two. Um, so there's this lovely to do here that says to do figure out better heuristics. And this is in heap.cpp um, in Dalvik. This is Google's code, <laughs> yes. Uh, this is Android 4.4.2. Um, and it's been around since maybe 2.3, maybe earlier than that. Um, and I'm not ragging on them. Their code is good. I like Android. But this line says, there will be a lot of churn if someone allocates a bunch of big objects in a row. And we hit the frag case each time, a full GC. So something that might be a big object is a JPEG or a bitmap. And as a Photos app, uh, yeah, you hit this. So you start up your app. And as you're allocating memory, they're growing the heap. Every time they grow the heap, they do a stop the world garbage collection. Um, so basically, every single allocation, they hit you. Um, and you know, you can say, hey, you should reuse bitmaps. And starting in Android 14, uh, Android 4.0, they provide a facility to reuse bitmaps. Although it's pretty limited. It has to be the same format, same dimensions, same everything. Um, but also, um, we need to reuse JPEG buffers because we also want to pre-cache JPEG buffers. So when you're scrolling, we're not going to disk to pull the images. Um, and JPEGs, um, you know, variable size format. 
Uh, we want to pre-cache a lot of them. We could have a bunch of those buffers around, but we don't necessarily want to have like the max JPEG size uh, for every buffer. So, and we don't want to build an allocator for JPEG buffers. Uh, so, how are we going to deal with this? Um, short story, we, uh, we moved all our JPEG buffers into C++. And we have a single buffer that when we want to decode a JPEG, we just copy the pre-cached JPEG into that buffer into Java. Uh, then we actually do the decode into a reused bitmap. It's still not perfect because we still have to allocate those bitmaps that we need up front. Uh, and we still do get some pauses because of that. Um, and the GC, yes, it's better in Android L, and we're hoping it will fix a lot of these things. Um, but what we know is not going to change is there's always going to be gotchas introduced by the Android framework. And by I'm not suggesting you rewrite your apps in C++ because of this, but if you do, or opportunistically pieces you do, it's really nice to have that tool to go in and uh, dive below the framework. Um, one second. So the final thing I want to talk about here is um, hiding memory. So uh, don't abuse this. I'm going to give you this tip, but don't abuse it. Um, you may already know. Uh, so Android regulates how much memory applications use. Um, by default, the heap for an application is around 64 megs. The OEM can set it. Um, you can turn on large heap, and then often you'll get twice as much. Uh, but again, we can make our app a lot faster by pre-caching a lot of JPEGs uh, when the user is not scrolling, when they're not doing anything. Um, and this was a fair limit for us. I mean, some of these devices have two gigs of RAM, and we really want to take advantage of that. Um, so it turns out if you allocate memory in C++, um, Android does not regulate it in the same way. There is a system level a watchdog that will make sure that apps don't run away, that they're not behaving poorly. But if you're in the foreground and the memory is available, they'll basically let you have it. Um, and so a big win for us here was just prefetching all our JPEGs uh, into C++. Not only addresses the allocation problem, but also allows us to prefetch a lot more, uh, giving a nicer user experience. Um, so that's a handful of wins I wanted to share with you. Do you guys have any questions about any of those? Yeah, so on the iOS platform, um, I can think of one particular win that we had. I'm not an iOS developer, so I might not do this win uh, justice. But um, all iOS objects have a uh, release and reference, uh, add ref and a release. I forget what they're called. Yeah. Yes. And um, on 32 bit platforms, um, they use a global table for keeping track of all those references. And so actually, we, were, we had about, again, this 30,000 item list in memory. And uh, at one point, we were increasing a reference to basically everything in the list and decreasing it. And uh, performance was pretty nasty. Um, and we thought about how we could work around it. Uh, but ultimately, when we moved everything into C++, problem gone. Adding and releasing references in C++ are super cheap by comparison. Now, that's fixed in the 64 version, 64 bit version. Yeah, so we do use share pointers. Um, a lot of stuff of ours is actually just objects and vectors. And often we, uh, we copy vectors, or there's a share pointer to that vector. But occasionally, um, so all our photos are arranged by event, and we have a data structure that points like event to set of photos. And that's a bunch of share pointers, basically. So. Um, can you tell me a type of problem you're thinking about? Uh, none specifically. I just uh, was wondering what your integration experience was with respect to the UI. Like versus the two platforms, or like just C against the views? Yeah, when you, when you went to tackle this in and of itself, did it go smoothly like you hoped? Um, yeah, so the question for the camera was uh, what were the trouble or any issues with integrating uh, against like the interface that the view provides, basically, right, versus our implementation? Um, for the most part, so we had implemented, a, we had photos in our main Android application already, and we had built Mailbox once before. So we had worked through a lot of the things that we were hoping for. So actually, it turned out mostly better because we applied some new concepts that we were looking to apply, uh, and we could do it because they were in C++, so we only had to do it once. Um, so an example of that, and we actually have a blog post that we wrote about this, it's the, on the Dropbox tech blog 
is um, like in Carousel, we don't re-query for data all the time. We incrementally update our data model. And uh, we present that in a way that's really nice for the Android list view so that we can do animations on the Android list view in addition to the iOS list view. The iOS list view, we did have to like rebuild the layer it wants on top, which is like the delta layer. So on Android, you don't really need the delta layer, and you can do animations by doing a delta in the UI, whereas on iOS, the view model provides the delta. Uh, so that was like maybe the biggest one. Um, for the most part, we got a lot of wins because we could use fewer bitmaps. We didn't have the JPEGs in memory. So we could just have exactly what we needed for a particular view. And we had like, since we were rewriting a lot of these things ourselves, we could tailor, to them. We could tailor them to the views. Are you, are you guys going to talk about that? No? OK. So um, we would consider doing it. Um, we kind of have a very, very lightweight pseudo ORM rolled around the SQLite. Um, there's, as Stephen mentioned, there are things that we're afraid of from ORMs uh, that experience has taught us can bite us, but we are not. Uh, but at the same time, we really want to make everything easier for application developers. So we're looking for the right trade-off there. And that is, like I would say, an unsolved problem for us that we're working on. Um, we just call new and delete, and we don't really call them. We use make shared. So, uh, yep. All right, I'm going to jump to Steven, but. Uh, so that's kind of all the like, low-level tech demos that we have. And we'll have some more time at the end for questions, so um, keep your questions in mind. But let's get through a few other things real quick. Um, so we're saying cross-platform. And kind of the theme of this whole talk has been why like, cross-platform for application developers is kind of scary. We're application developers. We're not kernel developers. Like All of you guys in here probably like, understand this code. Um, but I don't. This is actually uh, Google's level DB uh, code, I believe. Um, but it's not the kind of things that day-to-day -day application developers who are iterating so fast and changing things under the hood, um, they don't need to be worrying about a lot of the like, um, cross-platform things like file system and networking. Uh, you want to keep that away from like, the application developers. Things that they do want to worry about cross-platform are things they have a lot of context on. Uh, things like list views, things like performance and garbage collection specific to their platforms. Um, push notification, re push registration, background fetch. Um, all these things are kind of specific to mobile, and so we want to empower our mobile developers um, to like work on these things. Um, so kind of the like, takeaway from this is we don't want our application developers going and, and redoing all the work that's been done in cross-platform by like, some of these great libraries. Um, another kind of benefit of like, leaning on like, open source libraries and other things like that is that you need to only make these choices one time. There's no like, big debate on like, what do we use on Android for like, JSON serialization? And do we use the built-in one in Objective-C? Or do we kind of like, use a faster one that we found uh, on like, GitHub? And so we basically don't have to make these cho uh, choices and you like, eliminate a lot of holy wars between developers this way. These are kind of like some of the soft benefits that you get um, on your team. Uh, so for us, um, we kind of like lean on a bunch of open source libraries, like SQLite, LevelDB, a little bit of OpenSSL, BitMagic, which is like a big bit vector implementation. We have two of our own that we've actually open sourced. The guy is up at the front, he wrote them both. Um, JSON 11 and Mini UTF. It's like very, very lightweight, um, like uh, Unicode library and very lightweight JSON library. So we've been talking about uh, cross-platform on mobile the whole time. And I gave like a little peek of like the desktop app earlier. Um, I would say that we can't really claim to be cross-platform until we're more than two, at least. And even just three is like pretty still, iffy, uh, still pretty iffy. Um, so Mailbox Mac. And, and at, the, at the surface, it looks like we should be able to reuse all this code. We have here is like a list of emails, uh, conversations, excuse me, a list of emails. We have like a list of your email accounts that you're syncing. We have a list of lists. And we have a list of list of lists. <laughs> Um, <laughs> oh, you just put a template on that and it's fine. Um, and then we also have like a list of contacts. So kind of like the list view uh, stuff that we put so much work into seems like it should just work. Um, and when we actually went to it, that wasn't the case. We ran into quite a few problems. Um, so one of the first one we got is that 
If you put like your language binding layer in a separate repository from like the C++ code, like even though you want to keep your C++ library all C++ and it like is very clean um, and stuff, you need those those um, code bases to be next to each other. If they're not, you get very weird um, interface mismatches. And if you do that on Android, it will like sometimes just work. The JNI like lets it work, and sometimes it will like crash without any seg fault, without anything. The JNI just stops responding to you, and you have no idea why. Um, so that was like a big problem that we like learned very fast. Um, we also like came up with this quality quality metric that our um, client side code needed to track master. We call it so it needs to always be using the latest shared library. And if it's not, you eliminate like a feedback loop. So if you're working on this cross-platform thing, you get a feedback loop from the iOS developers, you get a feedback loop from the Android developers, but if you're not getting like API design feedback from the desktop, then you are just basically leaving them in the dust. Uh, you need that feedback to develop a good API. You need to basically talk to your users, um, users of your API to figure out what's best. Um, and then kind of like just a few educational things, like try to explain like a linker error to a Java programmer, try to like explain a template error to anyone, um, <laughs> and, and you get, like, get all these things like kind of piling up. And then uh, another platform also refines uh, some of the assumptions that you made about your API. So there's some implicit things about API usage that in reality probably not well documented. Um, there's some implicit usage patterns. Uh, you have to like maybe communicate through the file system or you're expected to do X before you call Y. Um, some of these things aren't well documented in real software. Uh, so these are all problems that we had and like kept us from building fast. But if you actually go back and look at them, these are not architectural problems. These are like problems of people. These are problems of working in teams. And so once we actually did address a lot of these problems, uh, we were able, able to build a lot of features on the desktop very fast. So we have a feature called Auto Swipe, which is basically uh, like Gmail's filtering that they do. And that was built with actually no extra C++ code. Uh, we have zero inbox photo, which automatically shows this photo um, whenever you have reached a zero state of your inbox. Zero C++ code was added to support it on desktop. Uh, as well as a kind of a huge feature, drafts, um, which has like very strict syncing requirements, uh, very strict versioning requirements, was actually no additional C++ code. Um, because we had figured out this way of working uh, between three client applications using one shared library. So there actually are a lot of big wins here. And I'm hopeful, I'm so hopeful, uh, for a Windows uh, application. So if any of you guys are Windows developers, like maybe you can come talk to me. Um, <laughs> great. So... Would you do it on RT or desktop? I'm sorry? For Windows, would you do WinRT or desktop? So the question was, would we do WinRT or desktop? I am not qualified to make that decision at all. I don't remember the last time I had a Windows machine running. <laughs> <laughs> I was Linux all through college, and then I have a Mac, so... Um, maybe someone else can answer that for you. Um, but so, like I said, it's not all like rainbows and butterflies. There are like some not great things. Um, first thing is like kind of lack of tooling. Uh, try to like debug Android and native code is pretty hard. Um, there's actually like a quote from John Carmack. It says, I don't think anyone is going to say great things about being a native developer on Android. And uh, he recently like followed up on Twitter, I think it was yesterday, saying that people are taking this way out of context. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he was specifically talking about C and C++ development on Android. There's just like not the tooling around it. Not a lot of people are doing it. Um, but I, I hope it will get better. I hope Android uh, or Google makes it better. There's, as far as I know, uh, no great cross-platform C++ IDE. Um, if you guys know of any, I'd love to hear about it. Um, I've been using Xcode a little bit, like a little bit of Vim. Um, I've heard of people using Emacs, but... Um, no, I, have, I just don't know like a great cross-platform C++ IDE. Uh, like I said, debugging on Android, crash reporting is like really hard to solve. Um, some weird bugs in like the Android NDK. I think at one point like regex just wasn't implemented. So if you didn't know that, that's sort of tribal knowledge you need to know. Uh, but there's nowhere that's like pointing you, hey, don't use this. It just like returns false every time you try to try to match it. Um, and some other various missing features like that. But uh, these guys in the front row can talk much more to that. Um, and memory of safety, um, so eventually you're going to integrate with third-party libraries. Like, you can't get around it. Uh, and it's like a C interface, so you still have some memory, um, memory safety issues that you can have there. Not completely solved by C++11. Um, and so then, like I said, more of the software issues. Uh, three different languages for two different clients just seems like kind of a terrible thing. Um, and then our C++ developers, this is actually kind of interesting. As soon as you get like some application developers writing in C++, 
they start to like worry about every single instruction. It's like this weird thing that because you're writing C++, it needs to be like so fast. And for the majority of the applications we're using it for, it just doesn't matter. So it's hard to stay productive um, unless you sort of address this um, from the start. And this is like, it's on like my roses have thorns slide, but uh, in practicality, you're not able to like build features on both platforms at the same time. Uh, mostly any feature you build is going to take some amount of iteration. Uh, and so we generally have started to build on one platform first and iron out all of the like oddities in the UI before we go to the other platform. So we still get this like flip flop between features. Uh, so it's not perfect, but that actually ends up being more productive uh, for your application as a whole. Um, and there's a bunch of things that we don't know uh, anything about. Like I said in the beginning of the talk, we're new to the C++ community. Um, we're still trying to like cross-pollinate some of these ideas. But we don't have um, great abstractions for UI developers, like message loops for concurrency. We're just using straight up mutex, condition variables, uh, STD thread um, for all of our stuff. And we think for applications there might be better solutions, uh, like willing to talk to you all you about it. Um, build systems has been pretty hard. We've had a little bit of experience with GIP, and it seems to be working a little bit for us. Uh, we're still figuring that out. Um, and like you had mentioned earlier, an ORM or some sort of better persistence abstraction, uh, it's an open question for us right now. So there are a lot of things that uh, aren't perfect. And like I said, we are just kind of diving into this, and we're actually here to meet people and talk. I'm sure there's plenty of you who are doing similar stuff or better stuff. Uh, we just kind of want to talk to you guys all and figure it out together. Cool. Uh, that's all I have for you guys. We have a few minutes left. We can get some questions in. Yeah. If you were doing C++ okay. then, like for C11, would you have been hesitant to take this route or not take this route at all of training the Java slash uh, uh, Apple developers to do C++? Mm -hmm. Would you have actually went this route? Um, I, I would probably guess no. Uh, we still would have considered it, definitely. Um, me, I like learned C++, the old C++ in college and I hated it. I uh, got back and like looked at C++ 11 for the first time and like started, it's now like my favorite language to program in. Um, if I'm implementing stuff on iOS, I actually go into C++ first, just because um, that's where I'm most efficient now. And, and one note on that is, uh, yeah, we probably would not, and I would say the primary reason is you could code in C++ 11 style before C++ 11 was what it is. Um, but by it becoming a standard, you know, cppreference.com has it well documented. You don't have to be like, read the spec or like cobble together libraries from Boost. So though, though there's much broader knowledge of C++ and that's really helped um, us with the team. Yeah. Did you find any differences between presumably GCC on Android and on iOS? <laughs> oh yeah, tons of differences. <laughs> uh, you can talk to these guys afterwards because right. I'm not nearly as qualified. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so do you guys share code between uh, Mailbox and uh, Carousel on, at a root level? Um, so as, as we were developing the two apps, um, we saw, sort of all had the same problems and not a great way to share between us. Uh, so recently we've been doing a lot more of it, uh, but initially it was more sharing of ideas uh, in the beginning. But now we're definitely doing a lot more of that. Yes. And, yeah. and we recently restructured our um, our repositories basically, so that code sharing is quite easy. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything with that? Uh, do you use Objective-C++ to interface with your C++ code, or do you have like an Objective-C interface or a C interface between uh, the C++ and the Objective-C? Uh, we do do Objective-C++, but I'm not gonna talk too much more about it because these guys uh, address this on Thursday. Yeah. Um, so for testing, I think actually ends up being a lot easier in my, um, my perspective because uh, what you're building is essentially a library, right? You can use all the testing frameworks of whatever the best like desktop platform that you use. Um, so for example, if you wanted to use gtest, you can do it and run it on the command line. You can run that on Android occasionally. But, so we have um, basically like library level tests. Uh, we have a, obviously like a lot of manual tests and we're exploring a lot with UI automation testing as well. Uh, but nothing novel there, except for the realization that like your client side code is much more testable because of the way that you're laying it out. And so we have plenty of like unit tests for the shared library part, uh, 
the other parts of it is the traditional UI testing problems that you run into. Did you say don't use an IDE for your uh, C++ development? <laughs> <laughs> is there any? <laughs> I, uh, I write in Vim and I browse in Xcode, so. <laughs> I mean, IDs have been a problem for us because, like, it's Xcode on Mac is pretty so, good. Okay. Yeah. What about, um, and then there's Eclipse as kind of a cross-platform C++ ID, but Android is not really supporting it. Uh, we're hopeful about Sea Lion, and uh, we're hopeful that uh, we, uh, the rumors are we don't have insight that Google might adopt it into their tool chain. No, so uh, JetBrains just released a new C++ IDE. The preview is out like yesterday or the day before. So. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of, the rumor factory says that c Line is going to support Android. We're hopeful. So I'm going to cut you guys off now. If you have more questions, can come up front and talk to us. We're happy to talk. Uh, if you're curious about more cross-platform mobile stuff, like I said, we've got the talk on Thursday. And Microsoft is actually giving two talks uh, right after this, uh, if you guys are curious about that. <laughs>